Welcome to Keith Knight, Don't Tread on Anyone. This is an excerpt from Basic Economics by Thomas Sowell. The contrast between the Soviet economy and the economies of Japan and Germany is just one of the many that can be made between economic systems which use prices to allocate resources and those which have relied on political or bureaucratic control. In other regions of the world as well, and in other political systems, there have been similar contrasts between places that used prices to ration goods and allocate resources versus places that have relied on hereditary rulers, elected officials, or appointed planning commissions. While many African colonies achieved national independence in the 1960s, a famous bet was made between the president of Ghana and the president of the neighboring Ivory Coast as to which country would be more prosperous in the years ahead. At that time, Ghana was not only more prosperous than the Ivory Coast, it had more natural resources, so the bet might have seemed reckless on the part of the president of the Ivory Coast. However, he knew that Ghana was committed to a government-run economy and the Ivory Coast to a free market. By 1982, the Ivory Coast had so surpassed Ghana economically that the poorest 20% of its people had a higher real income per capita than most of the people in Ghana. This could not be attributed to any superiority of the country or its people. In fact, in later years, when the government of the Ivory Coast eventually succumbed to the temptation to control more of their country's economy, while Ghana finally learned from its mistakes and began to loosen government controls on the market. These two countries' roles reversed, and now Ghana's economy began to grow, while that of the Ivory Coast declined. Similar comparisons could be made between Burma and Thailand, the former having had the higher standard of living before instituting socialism, and the latter, Thailand, a much higher standard of living afterwards. Other countries, India, Germany, China, New Zealand, South Korea, Sri Lanka, have experienced sharp upturns in their economies when they freed those economies from many government controls and relied more on prices to allocate resources. As of 1960, India and South Korea were at comparable economic levels, but by the late 1980s, South Korea Korea's per capita income was 10 times that of India. India remained, remained committed to a government-controlled economy for many years after achieving independence in 1947. However, in the 1990s, India jettisoned four decades of economic isolation and planning and freed the country's entrepreneurs for the first time since independence – in the words of the distinguished London magazine, The Economist, there followed a net growth of 6% a year, making it one of the world's fastest growing big economies. From 1950 to 1990, India's average growth rate had been 2%. The cumulative effect of growing three times as fast as before was that millions of Indians rose out of poverty. In China, the transition to a market economy began earlier in the 1980s. Government controls were at first relaxed on an experimental basis in particular economic sectors and in particular geographical regions earlier than others. This led to stunning economic contrasts within the same country, as well as rapid economic growth overall. Back in 1978, Less than 10% of China's agricultural output was sold in open markets instead of being turned over to the government for distribution. But by 1990, 80% was sold directly into the market. The net result was more food and a greater variety of food available to city dwellers in China and a rise in farmers' income by more than 50% within a few years. In contrast to China's severe economic problems, when there was heavy-handed government control under Mao, who died in 1976, the subsequent freeing up of prices in the marketplace led to an astonishing economic growth 
of 9% per year between 1978 and 1995. While history can tell us that such things happened, economics helps explain why they happened. What there is about prices that allows them to accomplish what political control of an economy can seldom match. There is more to economics than prices, but understanding how prices function is the foundation for understanding much of the rest of economics. A rationally planned economy sounds more plausible than an economy coordinated only by prices linking millions of separate decisions by individuals and organizations Yet Soviet economists who saw the actual consequences of a centrally planned economy reached very different conclusions. Namely, quote, there are far too many economic relationships and it is impossible to take them all into account and coordinate them sensibly. Knowledge is one of the most scarce of all resources and a pricing system economizes on its use by forcing those with the most knowledge of their own particular situation to make bids for goods and resources based on that knowledge rather than on their ability to influence other people in planning commissions, legislatures, or royal palaces. However, much articulation may be valued by intellectuals. It is not nearly as efficient a way of conveying accurate information as confronting people with a need to, quote, put your money where your mouth is. That forces them to summon up their most accurate information rather than their most plausible words. Human beings are going to make mistakes in any kind of economic system. The question is, what kinds of incentives and constraints will force them to correct their own mistakes? In a price-coordinated economy, any producer who uses ingredients which are more valuable elsewhere in the economy is likely to discover that the cost of those ingredients cannot be repaid from what the customers are willing to pay for the product. After all, the producer has had to bid those resources away from alternative users, paying more than the resources are worth to some of those alternative users. If it turns out that these resources are not more valuable in the uses to which this producer puts them, then he is going to lose money. There will be no choice but to discontinue making that product with those ingredients. For those producers who are too blind or too stubborn to change, continuing losses will force their business into bankruptcy so that the waste of the resources available to the society will be stopped that way. This is why losses are just as important as profits from the standpoint of the economy, even though losses are not nearly as popular with businesses. In a price-coordinated economy, employees and creditors insist on being paid, regardless of whether the managers and owners have made mistakes. This means that capitalist businesses can make only so many mistakes for so long before they have to either stop or get stopped, whether by an inability to get labor and supplies they need, or by bankruptcy. In a feudal economy, or a socialist economy, leaders can continue to make the same mistakes indefinitely. The consequences are paid by others in the form of a standard of living lower than it would have been if there were greater efficiency in the use of scarce resources. In the absence of compelling price signals and the threat of financial losses to the producers that they convey, inefficiency and waste in the Soviet Union could continue until such time as each particular instance of waste reached proportions big enough and blatant enough to attract the attention of central planners in Moscow who were preoccupied with thousands of others of decisions. Ironically, the problems caused by trying to run an economy by direct orders or by arbitrarily imposed prices created by government fiat were foreseen in the 19th century by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, whose ideas the Soviet Union claimed to be following. Engels pointed out that price fluctuations have, quote, 
forcibly brought home the individual commodity producers, what things and what quantity of them society requires or does not require, end quote. Without such a mechanism, he demanded to know, quote, what guarantee we have that necessary quantity and not much more of each product will be produced, that we shall not go hungry in regard to corn and meat while we are choked in beet sugar and drowned in potato spirit, that we shall not lack trousers to cover our nakedness while trouser buttons flood us in the millions, end quote. Marx and Engels apparently understood economics much better than their latter-day followers. Or perhaps Marx and Engels were more concerned with economic efficiency than with maintaining political control from the top. There were also Soviet economists who understood the role of price fluctuations in coordinating any economy. Near the end of the Soviet Union, two of these economists, Shelmev and Popov, whom we have already quoted, said, quote, everything is interconnected in the world of prices so that the smallest change in one element is passed along to the chain of millions of others. These Soviet economists were especially aware of the role of prices from having seen what happened when prices were not allowed to perform that role. But economists were not in charge of the Soviet economy. Political leaders were. Under Stalin, a number of economists were shot for saying things he did not want to hear. Next section, supply and demand. There is perhaps no more basic or more obvious principle of economics than the fact that people tend to buy more at a lower price and less at a higher price. By the same token, people who produce goods or supply services tend to supply more at a higher price and less at a lower price. Yet the implications of these two simple principles, singly or in combination, cover a remarkable range of economic activities and issues and contradict an equally remarkable range of misconceptions and fallacies. Thank you for watching Keith Knight, Don't Tread on Anyone, and the Libertarian Institute.